Unfortunately, Dr. Beeching closed our railway in 1966. Now one must travel by road to reach Bude, many using the route via Holsworthy. On reaching the high ground east of Stratton, one gets a magnificent panoramic view of Bude Bay. Before the coming of the railway, the Reverend W. Maskell, who rented Bude Castle in the 1860s, describes this view in an article he wrote about that period, which was later published in a book called Odds and Ends. It is worthwhile to go to Bude by the road through Holsworthy, on account of the superb view which suddenly opens about halfway from that town, upon the top of the last hill, which sinks with a gradual descent of several miles down to the margin of the sea. A vast expanse of country spreads before his eyes on either side, and an horizon bounded by the distant undulations of a semicircle of lofty hills, bending in every direction downwards to the west, with the outlines of a thousand cliffs and hollows of the larger bays, and the glorious sea itself gleaming and distinct beneath his feet, lighted, it may be, under the slanting brilliance of a setting sun. Bude Haven is a hamlet in the parish of Stratton in Cornwall, about 22 miles from Biddyford and 20 from Lawson. The population may amount to some 700 or 800. The men mostly employed in manning the 20 sloops and schooners of the port, and also employed in loading and unloading vessels which trade from and to the place. Large employment is also given to the proprietors of the Bude Canal, which carries goods in two or three directions into the interior of the county, and immense quantities of sea sand for the farmers for manure. The village of Bude lies upon two sides of a small stream, which runs into the sea at the mouth of the harbour. It belongs chiefly to two proprietors only, and consists upon the north side of a scattered collection of houses, some in rows, some singly, extending up a moderately sloping hill. Upon the other, of rows of houses and a pretentious-looking hotel, a new church, the parsonage, and the Coast Guard station. Let us see how dear old Bude developed. Up to about 1300, ships could sail as far as Heelbridge at high tide, and the River Neat, which was a wandering stream, no longer follows its original course, as it was straightened about 1960. For a period, this small river was possibly a barrier between the Celtic race living in Cornwall and the invading Anglo-Saxons. Walesborough Farm was possibly the site of a borough or fort of the Wallies, or strangers, according to the Anglo-Saxons. Between the 11th and the 14th centuries, vast quantities of sand blew in, covering much of the present town, the golf course, and creating Shoulder Hill and Castle Hill, both of which were originally much larger than at present. This sand had a high lime content and was valuable to farmers to improve improve the condition of the soil. From the earliest times, various kings gave permission for the sand to be taken freely from the beaches. The earliest recorded sites in the town are Ebbingford Manor from 1183 and Flexbury from 1201. Let us go over to Ebbingford and listen to the present owner, Mr. Brian Dudley Stamp, as he tells a little of the history of Ebbingford. It has a long, unbroken history, all of which has now been traced. The first mention of the house is in a pipe roll of 1183, when a certain Henry Herries held the manor of Ebbingford, or Eberford as it was called, by service to Lanston Castle. The service was to provide a guard for the guarding of the keep at the castle. 
in the Civil War, the Arundels were firmly royalist. The house was occupied by a Mary Arundel, the daughter of the famous Jack for the King, Sir John Arundel, defender of Pendennis Castle at the end of the Civil War. In the first campaign in the West, the Royalists reached Efford on the night before the Battle of Stamford Hill on the 16th of May 1643. A, con a council of war was held at the house on the evening before the battle. The next day the Royalists fought all the way from Efford House right up to the stop of Stamford Hill where they were victorious on the afternoon of the 16th. In 1400, Walter Crike, the vicar of Stratton, was given a license to celebrate Mass in the chapels of St. Michael on Chapel Rock and St. Leonard, which was possibly on the cliffs near Efford Beacon. All trace of these chapels has long since gone. Before the construction of the breakwater, Chapel Rock was much larger, and the decaying remains of a chapel on this rock were referred to by Richard Carew in his survey of Cornwall in 1602. It is possible that the name of Bude comes from the prayers offered in this old chapel. The original meaning of the word bead was prayer, and this was known as Bede's Haven. According to Blanchminster records, these old houses were acquired in 1421 and were known for several hundred years as Popa's Place, near the bank of the sea in the parish of Stratton. As early as 1535, Simon Simons was appointed a master of the port of Bude, and Granville Key Cottage implies that there was once a key near this site. In 1577, the Blanchminster Charity made a contribution to this key. Sir Richard Grenville purchased the Manor of Stratton in 1577, including the Manor of Binnamy, i.e. all the land to the north of the River Neat. The Carrier's Inn dates from 1543, and probably was originally a farmhouse. In 1589, a grist mill, using the power of the tides, was constructed by Lady Arundel in cooperation with Sir Richard Grenville, together with a causeway, which Richard Carew describes in his survey of Cornwall in 1602 as being of great benefit for the people to cross the river. The 1881 census of Bude names those houses as number one, two and three, the causeway. Before the Battle of Stamford Hill in May 1643, the Royalist army had secured a pass across this bridge. Half the army encamped on some of these downs, the remainder on Efford Beacon. The villa at Bude was built by that noted fox hunter, Mr. Arskett of Tetcut, about the year 1775, as a residence for the summer months near the sea. It was lived in after his death by his widow until 1798, when Richard Kingdon, the grandfather of the Reverend Claude Kingdon, took it. From a letter written by him in August 1798, it appears that two or three families from Lanson came to Bude in August for the purpose of bathing. They lodged probably over the shop for earthenware, pots and pans, and over the grocer's shop, built about 1780. The little inn sold ale and spirits to the sailors, and to the carters who came for coal and sand. The little ships had no wharf, but unloaded on the shore when the tide was out. There was no canal or accommodation of any kind, therefore no employment for labourers. A few hovels, of which two were under the shelter 
of the sand hills, a little south of the castle gate, nearer where the seaman's shelter now is. This same letter of 1798 goes on to say, there was a grass slope from the villa to the road, and a little green painted gate. At the high tides, the sea used to wash seaweed, etc., in under this gate. The old mill house was in two cottages, now known as Nanny Moors, by the footbridge. Carriages and carts drove through the water just opposite, near the present bus stop. About 1780, the Bude Inn, later the Bude Hotel, was built on the site of the present Lloyd's Bank, and the same year Mr Bray built premises in the Strand and two stores, and started the business of coal and general import and corn export. In a publication, the Universal British Directory of 1791, it states, Two miles from Stratton is Bude Harbour, belonging to the port of Padstow, where there has been of late years a considerable trade carried on in exporting corn, particularly oats, to different parts of the kingdom, and vast quantities of bark to Ireland. This was used for the tanning of leather, and came from the oak trees which were especially grown in this area. Also of importing coals and salt, the former from Wales and the latter from Bristol. There are commodious cellars lately built on the site of the present Effort Cottage, to receive the goods imported, which are forwarded to the respective owners almost immediately. Between 1809 and 1813, the first ordnance survey maps of this area were prepared and showed many familiar place names. In particular, Summer Lees is shown as Summer Lees for the local people to graze their animals in the summertime. This was called Sommer Lease in a lease for Plexbury Hall in 1688. You will see Mare Lake, Flexbury, Will, now well, Broom Hill, Broad Meadow, the name of one of the fields of Broadclose Farm, Bridge Hay, near Bagbury, Berry, the bottom of Stratton Road. Thorn, Rods Bridge, Upton, Linston, and Ebbingford. After the first plan for a canal was abandoned in 1774, there was continued interest in the project for many years, resulting in firm proposals starting again in 1817. This map shows the proposed route through the valley, which was on the south side of the river, and the line of the small canal, which was a suggested cheaper alternative, which would have finished somewhere near St. Martin's Church in Killerton Road, and would not have had a sea lock. Notice how few buildings existed in 1817. Mr. James Green, in 1818, presented his report to the subscribers to the Canal Company, and an Act of Parliament was passed in 1819, allowing its construction, which began on the 23rd of July, 1819, with a special ceremony watched by an estimated crowd of 12,000 people. On October the 22nd, 1820, an inspector says that, in company with the chairman, he watched the effect of the high tide and seas on the breakwater and sea locks, and counted 340 men on the works. In 1820, Huckin and Company stores were built in the Strand on the site of the Strand Hotel. They were merchants to shipping and bankers. In the County Museum in Truro, there is a five-pound note issued on the 18th of November 1820 by Illingsworth and Easdale and B. Easdale had a bank in the villa. 
In 1820, Mr. Samuel Brown came to Bude from Boscastle and found that there was no place of worship, but he found that a group of friends met in the kitchen of Efford Manor, part of which was at then a farmhouse, for prayer and praise. In 1826, they moved to an adapted dwelling behind what is now Lansdowne Bakery, having to enter through a narrow, dark passage. This was the first chapel of the Methodists in Bude. In 1826, the series first came to Bude, and from 1852, she remained in the Petherick family for four generations, until she sank off the coast of North Devon in, 18, in 1936. She had a very interesting history, and for many years she was the oldest active ship on the British Register, completing 125 years of service without losing a single member of her crew by drowning. In 1830, Robert Stapleton established a shipyard in the upper basin of the canal, which continued until 1917, and several vessels were built there, and others, such as the series, were altered there. This picture shows the launching of the Annie Davy in 1872. The vessels had to be hauled out and launched sideways into the canal. The Storm Tower was first built about 1830 for the convenience and shelter of the Coast Guards and because of coastal erosion was moved to its present site about 1880. In 1832, Sir T.D. Ackland applied to the ecclesiastical commissioners for permission to build and endow a chapel in Bude Haven at his own expense, using the argument that the recent census for the parish of Stratton to be over 1,600 people, yet the Stratton church could only hold about 500. Those living at that time in Bude, Linston, Upton and Rodsbridge numbered 571. The Bude church was built between 1834 and 1835 and Bude became a separate parish in 1848. At about the same time, the Wesleyan Methodists felt that their first chapel was too small and inconvenient, so they had a second chapel built on Blanchminster land near the villa, now used as auction rooms by Messrs. Kibbles. When they moved to their second chapel, the members of the WMA Methodist Free Church, later known as the United Methodists, took over the vacated premises behind the Lansdowne Bakery. Sir Goldsworthy Gurney, the Cornish inventor, had the castle built at Bude about 1830 proving that with concrete foundations it could be built on sand, and this was done, just above the high water mark, apparently the first time that that had been done in this country. Gurney became famous for his steam carriages, for the Gurney stove, which method was used to heat the castle and later the Houses of Parliament, and also the Bude light, a method of sending oxygen through the flame of burning oil to produce an extremely bright light, one example of which was erected on the embankment in London. The map of 1836 shows the first house in the Crescent, one time called South Terrace, Shoulder Terrace, and later Frying Pan Row, and it was also called Sir T. D. Ackland's New Road in the map of 1826. Two houses are shown in the middle of Breakwater Road, previously called Canal Cottages. At the far end of the Breakwater Road, East and West Cottages and Effort Cottage now appear, built about 1828. Also the castle and parish church both appear on the town map for the first time, as does the west side of King Street and more buildings along the Strand. In the early 1840s, the local post office business was transacted at number one Garden Terrace, now Lansdowne Road, with a post box around the corner leading into King Street. In 
Later in the same decade, the office was moved to the house next to the Crescent Bridge, built for collecting tolls. The letters being posted in the left-hand window of the entrance. The sorting being done in the little room on the right where there is now a bay window, looking out over the river. In the early 1850s, the postal headquarters moved to the other end of the Crescent, where there is still a sub-post office. In 1899, Stratton became the sub-post office, and as a result of increased work at Bude, the Crescent post office was too small, and a new post office was built in Blanchminster Square, now the Triangle, on the site of the present National Westminster Bank. On March the 22nd, 8, 1928, the present post office was opened at the top of Bellevue, on a site which had for many years been reserved for a proposed new Anglican church. In February 1838, the original breakwater was destroyed by violent storms, and it was rebuilt the following year, the stones being brought along a tramway from under Compass Point by horses that drew a whim around in the usual way that whims were used in Cornwall. Originally, the breakwater had an outer layer of large rocks inside which was shingle. The breakwater was made with a gentle seaward slope, similar to the Plymouth breakwater, that was better able to resist the pounding of the heavy seas. A few years ago, cement was pumped into the centre of the breakwater, and the gaps on the seaward side were filled with cement, since when great changes have appeared on the foreshore. Little is known of the first lifeboat to be stationed in Bude, in 1817, for a short time, except that it was allowed to fall into disrepair. The second lifeboat, the Royal William, was given by King William IV in 1837, and was an unstable craft, capsizing on exercising in the harbour, when two of the crew were drowned. In 1853, she was replaced by a self-writing boat. In 1863, a lifeboat house was built near the Falcon Hotel, with money from the family of Elizabeth Moore Garden, and three later lifeboats were named after her, the final one in 1911 being withdrawn in 1923. Occasionally, the lifeboats were launched through the locks when the tide was right, but more often it was taken to sea on a special carriage drawn by ten horses. As can be seen, the later lifeboats were powered by ten oarsmen, and often it was impossible for the lifeboat to reach the scene of disaster, so more lives were saved by the Coast Guards with their rocket apparatus, the gear being stored in Rocket House in Breakwater Road. The most famous wreck was in October 1862, when the Ben Coulin was wrecked with a loss of 30 lives. Education for most local children started in the old Bude Junior School near the Crescent, which was originally a charity school. In Truro Record Office are the minutes of the school managers of the Bude C of E School from 1839 to 1861 but there is no sign of the school on the tide map of 1840. In the 1851 census, in the schoolhouse was schoolmaster Henry B. Williams, with daughter Elizabeth, a teacher, and son Francis R., a schoolmaster's assistant. At the same time, in the house by the old bridge was Anne Crang, aged 18, who was a schoolmistress. Until 1938, this was an all-age school, but the Bude Grammar School was founded in 1909 as a secondary school for about 60 pupils who could go there from the age of 11 if they had passed the scholarship or if fees were paid for their education. After 1938, 
The remaining older children went to the secondary modern school in Stratton, at present the lower school of the comprehensive school, which catered for all older children from about 1973. The infant school children left the old school site when their new school opened near Broadcoast Farm in the early 1980s and the junior school moved to a new school beside the infant school in 1986. In addition, there were several private schools. In an advert in 1903 for the Collegiate School Bued, the principal was William R. Dunstan, a preparatory school for the public schools through practical education was offered for young boys on modern lines. Systematic nature study, a special feature, large playing field for golf, cricket, etc., riding lessons and sea bathing under careful supervision. St. Piran's pre preparatory school for boys and St. Catherine's school for girls no longer exist, but St. Petrot's school in Ocean View Road, originally for boys only, has taught girls as well for several years. In William Maskell's book, Odds and Ends, written somewhere between 1862 and 1872, he states that there is no doctor resident in Bude, considerable as the population is, but there soon may be. Neither is there a lawyer in the place. One would have to travel to Stratton to benefit from their services. For many years, doctor surgeries were held in their private homes, but later, a central surgery was opened in Morwenna Terrace, and that lasted from 1961 to 1985, after which they all moved to the health centre beside Stratton Cottage Hospital. Originally, there was a horse-drawn ambulance in the castle, but in 1928, Dr. T.A. King pressed the council for a motor ambulance which eventually was garaged in Maynard's Garage in Ben Coolen Road and remained there until the new station was built in 1967. Trade on the canal continued from 1823 to 1898 when it closed on the arrival of the railway at Bude, but only a few of the latter years did it pay a dividend to its shareholders. As many as 40 vessels used Bude Harbour at its peak, and the shipping trade continued until the beginning of the Second World War. The first bridge across the canal near the Falcon Hotel was a swing bridge, which was replaced by a larger swing bridge in 1887. This bridge had to be strengthened during the Second World War to take heavy army vehicles. The present bridge was built to take increased post-war traffic using the attractive coastal route south via Whitmouth. Beside this bridge ran the railway siding to the wharf, and early morning shunting trains provided great interest to some school children as traffic was held up by the blocked road. Listen to Mr. Bickle, recalling some of his early memories. And, uh... As a matter of interest, when we were going to school, they, the boats would come up and go up in the iron wall yeah. from the stores now, which is the Adventure Centre. Yes. And, yeah. um, of course, us used to wait for the bridge to open and then watch it while well, it was late for school. Yeah. So, uh, the bridge was open. Well, so you couldn't get across the canal. You see, you couldn't come. <laughs> but one day, you see the bridge was one going to be open till gone now. Seen Mr. Pound, he was the harbour master, see? Yeah. So uh, they um, said, So, well, let's come there, please. So the bridge was open. The bridge was open at five past nine when you should be in the school. Yeah. Uh, out come his cane, wow. twice across each hand, you yeah. see. One up behind when you went out, there was four five of us was at the yeah. cane that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In the late 1870s, both the Wesleyan and the 
Free Methodists, later the United Methodists, felt the need for new, larger premises, and tenders were sought in 1878. The Free, Method Free Methodists Chapel was opened in 1879, and those premises later became the drill hall when they moved to their new chapel at Plexbury in 1905. The Wesleyan Chapel, now known as Central, was opened in 1880, with the Sunday school premises added in 1911. Before the closure of the canal, people without their own wells were able to obtain water from a point in the chute triangle. In 1898, discussions were underway for water to be brought to Stratton and Bude from Rasford Moor, and the official opening of the Bude Waterworks was performed by General Buller on, in May 1903. Tamer Lake, which had been built to supply water for the Bude Canal, now became the local reservoir. In 1903, Messrs. N.T. Keat secured the contract for tapping the new water mains and making connections to the 500 or so houses in the area. With the coming of the railway, Bued gas works were constructed near the station and continued to supply the needs of Bude until we were connected to the national grid about 1970. In 1897, there were plans for an electricity supply for Bude, which would need 50 public lamps and 1,200 private ones. The Bude Electric Supply Company was incorporated in October 1907. In January 1908, the Urban Council received a letter from the Electric Supply Company saying that they might not be able to commence lighting at the same at the time agreed upon. In December 1927, the Urban Council entered into a contract for street lighting in Stratton and Bude at the same cost as the oil lamps were entailing. So they built what was known as the old picture house. Yep. So uh, shall I give you a little bit of how that yes. was done? The old picture house was built by a man called Booth on land at the end of a row of houses called Burn View, part of which were facing the golf links. The silent films finished in 1931 when came the talkies, that's what they called them. The last silent film to be shown was the silent house. Bude has continued to grow ever more rapidly. The canal brought trade to the area. The railway brought vast numbers of visitors. Hotels and boarding houses were built to provide for the visitors who first came by stagecoach, then by rail, and now by car or coach. Many people from other parts of the country have found Bude's mild climate and, a, and attractive scenery an ideal place in which to retire, causing more estates to be built and providing additional trade for local businesses. That this video will bring back memories of dear old Bude to those who remember it as it used to be, and that newcomers will understand more about the town and preserve the best for future generations to enjoy.